want to defend economic freedom? Well, the first thing you're going to need is a thick skin. Because as soon as you start talking about free markets, about getting rid of regulations, about letting people follow their dreams, you're going to get accused of all kinds of nasty things. You're going to be told you want people to be poor. You're in favor of greed. All, this, all these slurs are going to come up. I promise they will. And you're going to be, have to be ready to shrug them off. And if you want to know why they're coming up, I suggest you read Thomas Sowell's book of Conflict of Visions. But that's not what I'm here to talk about at the moment. I'm going to here to talk about the thing you're going to need after the, thin, the thick skin. And that is Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson. This is where you start disentangling all the confusion about economics that leads people with the best of intentions, and they really do have the best of intentions, to adopt policies that just don't work. They create job creation schemes that increase unemployment. They create anti-poverty measures that trap people generation after generation in poverty. The endless list of policies that don't work, it's staggering, it's depressing, but we've got to find some way to get people to understand what's wrong with it. And Hazlitt's book is the place to start, first of all, because it's a miracle of clear writing. Economics can be complicated, economics can be forbidding, economics can be gloomy. Not for nothing did Carlyle call it the dismal science. But Hazlitt's book is not dismal. It's full of very quotable lines like, today is already the tomorrow the bad economist told us to ignore yesterday. Or something very simple like, we cannot distribute more wealth than is created. And that's very often what's wrong with the program. They're going to give everybody everything, but we haven't got everything to give. Simple common sense. But there's a lot more to it than that. There's this very clear way of thinking about economic proposals. Hazlitt starts with an example that actually comes from Frederick Bastiat, a brilliant writer, tragically died young in the 19th century. It, he calls it the fallacy of the broken window. He says, imagine some hooligan throws a brick through a window and a crowd gathers. And they look at it and they say, hey, you know what? The guy whose window's broken, he's going to have to get a new window. And he's going to go and he's going to spend money, pay the installer, buy the glass. And that's going to create wealth because then the guy who installed the window is going to have money in his pocket. He's going to go and spend it. Maybe he'll get his kid a bicycle or something. The guy that you buy the glass from, now he's going to go out and get his kid braces or piano lessons. And there's going to be this wonderful spillover effect. Hey, you know what? The guy who broke the window is a public benefactor. Now, you don't hear it quite like that. But what you do hear all kinds of arguments where somebody's going to do something and it's going to create this S multiplier effect, there's going to be a ripple effect, there are going to be spin-offs. Th we hear this language all the time. But Hazlitt says, hang on a second, it's all true what they say. Right? The guy who you buy the glass from really will go and spend the money on something. The problem is, the person who had to replace the broken window now won't have the money. He won't go and get his daughter piano lessons. He won't go get his son a bicycle. And so all the benefits are cancelled out and all you're left with is a window that used to be intact and is now broken. We're poorer by that broken window. And Hazlitt says, when you look at what's just happened here and how this marvelous vision of a Keynesian multiplier has just been shattered like a window that a hooligan threw a brick through, you discover that the key to economic analysis, the single thing you have to do always when someone has a policy proposal, is don't just look at the short run and the people immediately affected. Always look at the long run and the impact on everybody. It's a simple insight. But I mean that in a good way. It's clear, it's powerful. It's the starting point for anything. I get all these press releases all the time, the government talking about how they've handed money to some factory or some lobby group, and isn't it marvelous? It will help them modernize their production facility or find new export opportunities. You say, yeah, okay, it actually probably will. This company probably will make money. They'll be able to pay wages. Maybe they can even give their employees raises. What, are you against raises to employees? No, but the money's got to come from somewhere. Other companies that you don't see are going to lose money. They're going to lose opportunities. Their employees will not get raises. Maybe they won't even have jobs because that will be the straw that broke the camel's back in this other enterprise. You always have to look at the long run and everybody that's affected. And you start to apply this line of reasoning and the world of policy looks dramatically different. It's Hazlitt says about proposals to raise the minimum wage that there's no way through legislation that you can make a person's labor worth more to an employer. You certainly can't do it by forbidding the employer to pay them less. And so what happens when you raise minimum wages, you say, oh, it's terrible that someone should have to get by on $8 an hour or $10 an hour. You don't make the person worth $12 an hour. You don't get them a job at $12 an hour. What you do is you 
you just cost them their job. Maybe not right away. It's hard for firms to adjust. In the short run, they'll take a loss on their employees. But over the long run, they'll automate. They'll contract out. They'll find other ways of doing things. And what you do is take a person with a low-paying job and throw them in, onto the unemployment line. And it's very hard to get a promotion when you're unemployed. Or take job creation. Has people always talk about job creation, want to create jobs. Well, Hazlitt says, look, if you really wanted to create jobs, all you'd have to do is ban trucks, transporting goods, make people carry everything on their backs. We'd have jobs. What we wouldn't have is wealth, opportunity, good wages. Or, yeah, we, you know, get rid of backhoes and make people dig the foundations of buildings with shovels or, for that matter, spoons. Sure, there's all kinds of ways to create work, you know, burn the entire city down and we'd all have work rebuilding it. But like the broken window, we'd be poorer. And Hazlitt produces gem after gem like this. His reasoning is clear, his language is compelling, his lines are quotable. And that's why you want to start by reading this book, even if you already have a good grasp of economics, even if you think you understand how the world works, watching Hazlitt analyze it so clearly and explain it so crisply will help you do the same thing. And that's a very important part of what we need to do. It's not just a matter of knowing in our gut that it's a bad idea for the government to intervene in the economy. We have to be able to explain to people whose automatic reaction is to assume that if you don't approve of a measure, you don't approve of the goal. You say, we've got an anti-poverty measure, and you say, that won't actually combat poverty. You say, oh, you just like to see poor people. I mean, you know, and it's kind of childish and mean-spirited, but it's so common that you can't just pretend it doesn't happen. You've got to have an answer to it. And to get that answer, Henry Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson. It is the indispensable first stop.